Hi, welcome to The Chip, the Canadian health information podcast. I'm your host, Alex Mahu. In this show from the Canadian Institute for Health Information, we'll give you an in-depth look at Canada's health systems and talk to patients and experts you can trust. Join me as I go beyond the data to find out more about the work being done to keep us all healthy. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Evan Adams, who is Coast Salish from Tlaaman First Nation near Pal River in British Columbia. Dr. Adams is a renowned physician, a public health expert, and an actor you might recognize from many popular TV shows and movies. We're sitting down with Dr. Adams to discuss Canada's first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, how residential schools have left a lasting impact on Indigenous health, and how his personal experience has affected his desire to help and to heal. In these most uncertain times, we find ourselves connecting remotely from across the nation. I'd like to collectively acknowledge the lands we all occupy, whether treaty or unsurrendered. As a reminder, the views expressed by the guests of the Canadian Health Information Podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the Canadian Institute for Health Information. Hi, Evan. Uh, Welcome to The Chip. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Alex. So nice to see you. I have to say, uh, it's not often I get to sit down with a doctor, a public health expert, and also get to say that I'm a fan of their movies. (laughs) Anything uh, lined up for a third career? I I hope not. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) I hope I get to sit around very soon. I hope that for you, too. Well, I want to ask you how you're doing, um, given your role as the uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Health for Indigenous Services Canada. I'm curious, it's been a difficult year for everyone, but how have you experienced, you and your team experienced COVID? Well, definitely my team is getting tired and I'm hearing that teams all over the country, mostly clinical teams are getting are getting pretty tired. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I do think that one of the major pieces of work is as we uh, deal with COVID uh, is to um, ask the workforce, how can we help you? How can we help you stay? How can we keep you happy? We know that you went all out. Uh, for the last uh, 19 months, but how can we do better? I, I'm definitely a bit droopy. I, I think I was pretty strong up until maybe uh, a month and a half ago, and I'm starting to feel uh, the wear and tear a bit. It really has been 80-hour weeks or uh, months and months and months with virtually no breaks, virtually no vacation, because it's a worldwide pandemic. It's yeah. it's uh, a really no breaks important from time it. to be focused. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your hard work during such a difficult time. The first official National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th is an important milestone, but it comes during a very heavy year. Many people are still processing the recovery of multiple mass graves at residential schools this summer and learning more generally about the horrors and pain that Indigenous people in Canada have endured. I know that For me personally, it's been hard to understand that residential schools were still operating when I was still in school. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share your personal connection to the system and maybe how that's impacted your life and your career. Yeah, for sure. Um, The uh, residential school system has been running for actually at least six generations. So it's, you know, long established and its effects are long established, and I certainly was aware of it in my extended family. And in my immediate family, both my parents went to residential schools, my mother from grade two to grade 12. And before that, she was in an Indian hospital for uh, two years. And my father went for a single year when he was 15. So um, my father's early life was defined. My father was an orphan, and so his maternal grandmother, and he said uh, she was a very honest woman. I have no reason not to not to believe her, she said she felt she would die without me. So she kept him uh, and she wouldn't surrender him to the residential school system. And so his early life was uh, uh, moving around so that they wouldn't take him. And uh, finally, when he was 15, he was found and sent away. But in his mind, he was he was a man and uh, he met my mother there and uh, they've been together ever since. So, yeah, they were 15 and 12, if you can imagine. Wow. And my dad turns 85 soon, and my mother's 80, That's uh, 81. That's story. So, yeah, I can't believe it. So, I definitely, they had stories about how horrible it was, particularly for my father. Absolute silence from my mother about what happened to her in her many years uh, there. 
And uh, these uh, recent discoveries of these um, unmarked graves is definitely um, reminded all of us about that very important um, chapter in Canadian history. It was it was heinous, and I think for many people. Um, hurting children is hard to contemplate, and so they, their reaction is to deny it. Maybe that's what's happened before, but now mm-hmm. with the graves, we can't. It, it's hard for us to deny it. But I, I do think some are already minimizing what those graves mean. So you obviously have a very direct connection to residential schools. Do you think that that's impacted your your wanting to go into medicine and and help people? Hmm. I should have mentioned I was part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I was one of the honorary witnesses, and and that was definitely in part because I'm a doctor. And when I was younger, I was quite aware that my mother's father had TB, Mm -hmm. and why my mother was sent to a TB hospital, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, And my father was orphaned by TB. Yeah, definitely those experiences shaped why I wanted to go into medicine. I wanted to help. And I was very aware that so many of my extended family had really difficult lives. The residential schools scarred minds and spirits, not just bodies. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important for people to remember that that uh, trauma inflicted uh, upon them uh, was long lasting. So I I really don't um, tolerate people minimizing it. In fact, I, I residential school minimizers always get a response from me. I feel like it's part of my duty from being a part of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission and being an honorary witness. You know, I talk about residential schools and I'm really glad to because, you know, of course I love my parents and uh, they deserve better lives uh, than they got. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone should know it. It's an important part of Canadian uh, history. Mm -hmm. You talked about the maltreatment of Indigenous people and how that is still happening to this day. I think it's also important to mention that residential schools have had a lasting impact on Indigenous people and also that systemic racism exists in the healthcare system still to this day. Yes, that's right. And that's an important part of my work. I I used to think of it as decolonizing the system so that Mm -hmm. um, people wouldn't have colonial experiences going into health institutions when they needed help. Sometimes Indigenous people used to, and maybe still do, uh, would go into a hospital and be demeaned uh, or humiliated or blamed or told off uh, just when they needed help the most. And I thought, why why does that occur? That should not be uh, happening for people. So I I was thinking of decolonizing the system, but really it's anti-racism work for us to realize that um, some of the structures that we've inherited, including our workplaces, can be inherently racist. And I remember in the midst of my training, an orderly, just speaking quite racistly and frankly, just to everyone in the workplace, like it was normal. And I said to him, "Um, I don't think you're allowed to speak like that. In fact, I think maybe it's not even legal. So maybe Mm -hmm. just drop it. Uh, and then he backpedaled uh, like crazy. I guess no one had ever called him on it in his workplace. And that's really just an example of a kind of a, a systemic anti-racism that needs to be, well, first of all, we need to uh, be able to identify it and then uh, knock it out of the way. Because health equity, equity of outcomes and not harming patients is part of the work. Absolutely. Well, and you're talking about this as a whole structure, but ultimately what we're talking about is personal stories, and the impact on individuals. I'm curious as to your thoughts on how important is the need to collect both stories and data in order to have a more comprehensive understanding of Indigenous health in Canada? Yeah, stories are data. And uh, I had a, a really interesting experience of that recently, meeting with a group of Indigenous physicians. I was meeting with them once a week during the time of COVID for the last 18 months. And uh, as we spoke together, and we were supposed to be talking about COVID, but we kept hearing from each other about some bad experiences they had in the midst of their training. And so uh, there's no data on negative experiences by Indigenous um, medical trainees. But by talking together, it was very clear that things had happened to them, in fact, to all of them, to all of us, that were 
pretty egregious, like not cool. That should not mm -hmm. be happening. And we decided that we would take a closer look at that and that we would alert the medical schools that this seemed to be a, a common story. It's not data, but it's a common story from all of us. So how do we look at anti-racism in the midst of medical training? So a very specific look at anti-racism, a very specific look at a certain set of structures, uh, medical schools, and uh, we found those. And of course, in public health, which I've been uh, working in for the last 14 years, collecting Indigenous specific data lets us know how we're doing. We, the structures that are supposed to look after people, how we're doing as marginalized populations or populations that live on the edge of the dominant culture, mm -hmm. but also lets us know what the differences are. And if you know the differences, then you can uh, take action. And I just look at the very simple example uh, that um, men and women have very different lives and we need to make room for that. It's really uh, important to be able to speak fluently about the different roles of fathers and uh, mothers within a nuclear uh, family, let alone uh, diversity within those families, let alone about it's quite a big um, extra you know, layer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And there and there are lots of um, different kinds of families. Like, why can't we? Why can't we talk about those? You know, where there's more or something different than one mom and one dad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One of Kai Hai's missions is to measure and to compare what's working in our healthcare systems and obviously what's not. What are some of the unique circumstances that need to be considered in Indigenous communities and maybe how can things be improved? I realize that's a big question for you. <laughs> no, it's great. Uh, I think COVID has really sharpened the point on this that we need to be able to see those differences. Uh, we know that from looking at the data that First Nations people, for instance, have uh, an active case rate three or four times higher that of other Canadians. And so we ask, uh, why is that? And I think some of the early answers were, were actually kind of blamed on Indigenous people. Oh, they must be going out. They must be uh, skipping vaccination. And then we had to go back to our basic principles to say, well, actually, blaming the patient all of the time is uh, not helpful and is very simplistic. Usually when uh, marginalized people are overly affected, it's because of the social determinants of health. And so uh, marginalized populations all over the world don't have similar genetics or similar physiologies. They have similar social contexts where there is a lack of equity, where there is um, racism, where there's um, poorer access to the social determinants of health, things like clean water or good hygiene, things like uh, adequate housing so you're not overcrowded. And being overcrowded in the midst of COVID can be disastrous. Uh, and a number of other issues like burden of disease. If a marginalized group is sicker uh, than the dominant group, then they're going to do worse in the midst of a uh, communicable disease event like COVID. So it's just a reminder that we need to look at all of the factors around uh, people and not just blame them, which doctors actually can tend to do if they're not in public health because they're so overly focused on the single individual patient. What can the patient do to make themselves well versus you know they live in a particular um, set of circumstances? Mm -hmm. Perhaps we all need a bit more humility. Mm. I want to ask another kind of large question, maybe a hard question for you. What's your hope for both the short and long term when it comes to Indigenous health in Canada? Well, I definitely would like for there to be parity. I think uh, race-based outcomes are actually immoral. Uh, where um, you know more white babies survive than indigenous babies is unfair. You must deal with that. And if you don't want to deal with it, at least get out of the way so that we can deal with that kind of inequity. The worst case scenario is you know the structures protect themselves and say, well, we're not going to do anything and we're actually going to make sure that you're not involved in this kind of situation. It's not fair for race-based outcomes to be protected by institutions because they're embarrassed or because they don't know what to do. I, we have to be really honest and say this is an untenable situation 
we can improve our services and outcomes. So let's go there. And second of all, what I dream about uh, is the recognition that um, Indigenous peoples and Indigenous health are unique. There's no need to melt it altogether into Canadian approaches. And I, I really saw this um, very frankly when I went to Hawaii and there were Hawaiians and then there were mainlanders who came to Hawaii. Uh, Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian people are really very um, beautiful. Why would they um, forget uh, hula in the Hawaiian language? And, uh, you know, everyone acts like they're from New York. It just doesn't make any sense uh, whatsoever. So Indigenous peoples have ways of being and knowing, ways of being well, ways of um, dealing with how to take care of their minds and bodies and spirits, how to raise good, strong people. They have culture and language that should not be erased. And so, yeah, there needs to be room for that in the multicultural, pluralistic uh, success story that's Canada. Mm -hmm. That needs to be embraced. I guess on the flip side of that question, I'm curious, is there anything that keeps you up at night? I, uh, I definitely have uh, something that keeps me up at night, and I'm still learning to enunciate it. Uh, it's very easy to, to complain and be uh, negative about some of the bad things that uh, happen. And there are lots of bad outcomes in COVID. Mm -hmm. This massive an effort, there are uh, mistakes. There are players who are not quite where they uh, should be efforts that you know weren't perfectly successful. And I wonder about my part in those. Am I doing enough? Am I smart enough? Am I fast enough? Am I strong enough? Am I contributing to inequities? I'm tired and maybe I shouldn't be tired. And can I work better, not harder? Constantly uh, reevaluating where I am to try and make things better because there's there's a way to play the game so that you you can leave the game and say I absolutely did my very best in that. And then there are other times where you come out of a game and you say ah, I just kind of faxed it in or I really I, my head wasn't in it. And so yeah, so I'm constantly thinking, and I and I think many many of us are feeling the same way. I don't know why. For instance, uh, people who are afraid of the vaccine think that uh, government or um, physicians are trying to do bad things when I know in my heart I'm working really hard to do extraordinarily uh, good things. And I lose sleep wondering, am I doing enough good? <laughs> okay, is, there, is there more that I can do? <laughs> I think the sheer fact that you're evaluating and thinking about it uh means you are making things better and you are improving the system. <laughs> Thank you. If there's one thing you'd want our listeners to know about Indigenous health that you haven't mentioned, like one thing we'd want to leave our listeners with, what would it be? I, I think the average Canadian who, who doesn't really learn a lot about Indigenous people, except those really facile, very shallow stereotypes, doesn't quite see the beauty of us. There are long entrenched institutions and structures that stand between us. So for instance, none of my white friends would come on the reserve and see where I lived and would meet my family. And I, I think even my close friends didn't have a strong idea of who we are. And uh, I know, and it's why I'm there working, uh, my people are very wonderful and beautiful and warm and, and funny. And I love working with them. I I love uh, helping out, and I wish, I wish sometimes Canadians didn't see us as a, a social problem or as their poor cousins down the road, that they would uh, see us uh, truthfully in our complexity. And in that complexity is a lot of beauty and honor and resilience. Mm -hmm. Evan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your stories and your heart with us, and uh, we look forward to talking to you soon. Great. Thanks, Alex, and thanks for the chance. Thanks for listening. Check in next time when we bring you more valuable healthcare topics and perspectives. If you want to learn more about Kaihai, visit our website, kaihai.ca. That's C-I-H-I dot C-A. And if you like what you heard, subscribe where you find your podcast and give us a follow on social media. This episode was produced by Sushana Smith, 
And our senior producer is Jonathan Kulai. I'm Alex Mao. Talk to you next time.